I'm going live. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I assume that we are live. It's five o'clock, and this is the post COVID music industry landscape talk and QA. Um, this is a panel led talk and music industry QA managed by Two Funky Art as part of Festival Two Funky 2021. We have an excellent program of live performances, which are running at Two Funky Complex in Leicester um, from now until Sunday night, and most are live streamed as well. If you want to catch any of the performances, it's Two Funky Empire on Facebook page and the YouTube <coughs> channel. I'm Yao, and I'm from an organization called The Playmaker Group. And we work in a variety of different ways across the music industry, including live events, content creation, and creative consultancy. But really, this panel is not about me. It's a 60 minute webinar that's focused on the pandemic and the impact on the music industry and where we go from here. So, whether you're an upcoming singer, rapper, artist in any way, DJ, producer, or manager, we hope that this panel gives you a lot of insight. And um, it is my ultimate pleasure to have a wonderful panel and I'll be asking them questions and um, but if you've got questions please send them over and we'll hopefully get to them so we'll have about 40 minutes of us yammering on and then hopefully 20 minutes of you guys getting your questions answered and yeah let's get into the panel let's meet the panel um so we will go around and get a little full name title and then a little bit of blame on you guys and um, feel free to talk because each of them are multi hyphenates doing loads of amazing things in the industry, so don't feel like you've got to be rushed. So we'll start with you, Nikkei. I'm Nikkei Durasaro. I am an artist, well, music manager. I look after an artist and a producer. Um, I'm also a music consultant, uh, speak on panels, and um, I've been recently lecturing at um, University of West London. I've been in the industry 10 years. That's me. Superb, superb. Um, ben, over to you, mate. Let's go North London. Northside, Northie. Um, my name's Ben Winter. Um, I, I, I wear many hats, not just this hat that I've got on my head. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm a manager, entrepreneur, um, also run production company label. Uh, I am also the entrepreneur and outreach manager at AIM, um, co-founder of Power Up, an initiative to, to end anti-black behaviour in the, in the UK music industry. Um, and if we're going to start doing these years, I'm going to show how old I am. And I've been in the game for about 20 years, but I started as a team, so I'll try and work it out. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, is that it, Ben? Gosh, you need to work harder, man. You, I thought you had... No, ben, ben is, is, is... I don't know how he fits it in. T, over to you. Uh, my name is T. I am a artist, spoken word. Um, I also do production. I also a musical direct. I'm a bassist, um, and yeah, I also do some like artist development stuff, and just you know little bits and bobs here and there. Um, I, I've been doing music for about professionally for about maybe about five or six years now. Wicked, wicked. So this guys, this is my dream dream panel. Um, <laughs> So oh, stop it. this is gonna be, well. I I, I asked you all, so this is my dream panel right now. So <laughs> not, there's not a more. I'll be doing it at five p.m. on a Friday than having this conversation. <laughs> so we're gonna get into the pandemic. Obviously, everybody's been impacted by it. Um, you know, personally, you know, career-wise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're gonna be looking at the lens of like the music industry and and kind of the circles you all move in and 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 yeah, what are the learnings and then. Obviously, like, where's it going to go? And, you know, with people like, um, you know, some of the people tuned in right now, you know, we obviously want to give hope because there is hope um, and obviously lessons learned as well um, so they can apply it. So the first question, I'm going to I'm going to start with Ben. Um, and then you guys feel free to chip in, Nikkei and, and T. So broadly speaking, how do you think the pandemic has changed the landscape of the music industry? Oh, um, that's, that's small that. question, isn't it? Small question, but you know. <laughs> uh, I think it's been really interesting. Um, I think at first, a lot of artists shut up shop and they were like, well, we can't do anything because, you know, we're locked down and so on and so forth. And then I think there was a realization that 
the world keeps turning. Um, and I know for like the, the, the talent that I look, up, look after, I look after producers and, and artists. At first, we shut down our studio um, during, during the first lockdown. Then it got robbed. <laughs> we decided we're never going to do that again. <laughs> and, you know, we reopened the studio and worked pretty much all the way through, through to now, you know, from what first lockdown was March. I think we went back in the studio around May. Um, and then we haven't been out of the studio. So, we, you know, we've been very responsible in terms of making sure everything's sanitized and, and doing all the checks regarding COVID, but kind of pushed on. And even with that, I found that a lot more international work happened that way as well. Um, because people started to work using Zoom, it then just became a no brainer for international sessions to take place. And I found that where in the past it might have been a bit more difficult to work internationally, all of a sudden people are just up for it. They're like, oh yeah, we'll jump in the session. So we end up doing sessions with people in Atlanta, or in Canada, or in New York, in LA. Um, and, and it was just a lot more frequent than, than it had been pre-pandemic. So I think in terms of collaboration from a creative <laughs> perspective, um, it, it generated a lot more. I think from an artistic perspective, I think artists started to think out of the box a lot more. Um, obviously a lot of people, you know, I was really encouraged to see how many artists were still performing online and, you know, and it went through phases because it started off and people were performing in the bedroom and it was all a bit, you know, cringy. And then it kind of, people started to really get creative and think about it and, and develop it. And, you know, you're at a point now where you're at, at the top end of the scale, you're seeing people like BTS who are going, okay, we're going to do a show, but we're going to generate millions and millions from this because we're going to sell millions of tickets for this show online. And, you know, they're still giving a top level performance, but people are tuning in all over the world. And then, you know, at the other end of the spectrum where you've got um, artists that are just coming into it, you're seeing them starting to perform and starting to think about their audience and looking at different ways of being creative. And I've seen so much creative performances that you know have really kind of they've been really good and I think they've put artists in, in a different space where moving out of the pandemic you're going to start to see a lot more um, live shows that are incorporating uh, digital viewing and so on and so forth and then from a business point of view I think the industry has proven that you don't have to be in the office nine to five in order to get stuff done I think for females uh, or female females especially, I think that it's really, it, it's kind of creating an opportunity to move the needle in terms of maternity leave and stuff like that, because obviously that's always been an issue. As much as people say it's not an issue, there's still an issue and it's an issue that shouldn't exist. And I think this has kind of proven that they don't need to be in the office 24 seven. And uh, I think you're going to start to slowly see a shift where um, women are going to be able to, to work from home and set their own schedules and work out a, a office to work ratio where they'll be able to do more. And generally, I think everyone's going to be able to kind of say, actually, I'm going to come in office three days a week rather than come in five days a week. So I've shown you I can do my work from home and people are going to be able to, to create a better balance. I'll never create that balance. I'm a workaholic, but other people will create that balance and, and go from there. Yeah. So I think on that, those three different levels from behind the scenes creatives to out front artists and, and executives, I think for me, those are probably some of the biggest things to come out of the pandemic. Wonderful. Um, thanks, Ben. Nikkei, what, what are your thoughts? How have you found it? And, and you know, you, you kind of weekly give views on the industry. I, I, I'm keen to underst yeah, understand your view on, on the pandemic and what we've learned. Yeah, I think ben, Ben's covered a lot of it. I think um, it's revolutionized like the way we think about music and just work in general, as Ben said, like I feel like there was this intense pressure always to be like up and down 
High Street Kensington, for anyone who's outside of London, that's where the majority of the labels um, are. They're kind of shifting now to more to King's Cross and that kind of area. But before that, you was, there was this pressure to always be there, you know? Um, and I think it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting to see um, people's mindset shift and kind of, as Ben has said, like sessions happening remotely, um, people, people having loads of meetings like um, on Zoom. And just also, I think it's kind of making people reevaluate value and purpose of meetings if you know what I mean I think people would especially in the music industry it's notorious for people kind of cancelling left right and center and you know being a bit flaky so now I feel like potentially we've become more productive because like do you know what I mean if someone flops a zoom meeting then it's like okay I'm still at home I haven't lost the traveling time or whatever um so yeah I just think yeah it's changed a lot in that respect um I was going to say in terms of just like um top level stuff obviously with people being at home a lot uh streaming has gone through the roof you know like so um spotify and apple they've seen like record um profit so that's one thing and um, personally like we've done with live music kind of not being uh, an option apart from live streaming but in-person live performances not being an option we've spent a lot of time doing housekeeping stuff and i think that's what a lot of people have done as well just kind of making sure like you know it's all the ppl stuff like you know, in order is all the PRS stuff in order. And um, people have also kind of turned a lot their attention to sync as well. So like where, where you've lost income on one end, if you if you manage someone who's a songwriter, then it's been a case of, okay, like what music do we have like that hasn't been released or placed or pitched or whatever? Can we get syncs? Can we place it with other artists? I know we've been actively doing that. Um, and I would also say, um, yeah, in terms of I'll echo what um, Ben was saying in terms of live streaming, I feel like um, from the conversations I've had with like booking agents and stuff, live streaming is definitely here to stay. It's, it's probably going to be an additional part to um, in-person shows when they when, when they fully come back. Um, and I think that was, you know, I remember going in 2017, going to meet them a conference in um, south of France and like, and they were showing like VR and, you know, the whole, exploring the whole idea about live stream and shows, whatever. And it felt so, I, I was really excited about it, but it felt so like, when is this going to happen and, and what's going to be the catalyst? And to me, the pandemic has been the catalyst to now kind of say, this makes sense, you know, like whether it's a case of like, um, just, uh, just kind of triggering people to think, do you know what, we're doing a show here in London the artist is not big enough to warrant a global tour or going to Australia or New Zealand where it's so expensive to travel there and whatever, let's live stream it and access those fans and build and, you know, whatever. So I think definitely to echo Ben that that's a massive um, shift in mindset in the music industry. Um, and then I think also there's just been with the absence of um, live shows, which used to be a really strong indicator of an artist's growth and, and, engagement and responsiveness all of the attention is shifted to digital now so it's literally what's happening on tiktok do you know what i mean and what's happening on on instagram or whatever and i think it's been good for lots of artists but really difficult for other artists so like obviously you've seen like the likes of ashniko like she's like blowing up on tiktok and like she's gone from zero to 100 where she was probably uh, the pandemic has benefited her <laughs> And same with Nina Nesbitt, like she went from, I think like zero, she didn't have a TikTok account pre-pandemic and then now got like, I don't know, half a million followers or whatever on TikTok. Um, and that's driven her back catalog of music, you know? So you're seeing people benefit in that way. Obviously, um, Tion Wayne, Ross, they've had number one, driven a lot by all the stuff that's been going on on TikTok. So I just feel like, yeah, there's just been more than ever a, like a, a focus on social media, but also just online activity. Um, and DSPs are even looking at that to determine whether or not they should champion certain artists as opposed to like pre-pandemic, it would have, you'd have been looking at that, but you'd also be looking at, oh, did they sell out, you know, Co um, Shepherd's Bush Empire or did they do this or do they do that? So I think there's been, yeah, much more of a focus online. Um, and I think one of the benefits probably is like just less distractions. I think people have been able to do deep work yeah. <laughs> because it's because you're not kind of like pulled left right and center and as I said traveling all the time or whatever so I feel like it's been yeah kind of yeah it's up you know pros and cons and in terms of the future I just think as I said that zoom is definitely here to stay and live stream is here to stay <laughs> um yeah those are my thoughts I was wondering because you touched on certain aspects like the the focus now on um 
digital, I suppose, um, I wouldn't say digital marketing, but um, look at a digital as indicator. And it was always an indicator, but you'd also be like, that person knows how to perform, you know, how to engage with audiences, et cetera. Same with, same with, I suppose, meetings and stuff. Like, it's great that you can pack in meeting after meeting on Zoom. Obviously, we want to know the impact of that on our brains, still a lot of from, but... Is there anything lost by the lack of human engagement? And and do you, do you foresee us actually coming out of this and having a balance, or do you think people will just want to do digital? And that's open to anybody, by the way. I think there'll be balance because mm. I'm like I've already started putting in in person meetings. I'm sick of being on Zoom. No offense, anybody putting this on Zoom, but it's like there's there's been days where I've done. The best part of 14 hours on zoom and that's not healthy it's not good for my eyes i know my eyes are, are, are feeling the effects of it um i don't want to be looking at screens for that long um and i'm not a person that i'm a people person i like to i like to feel people's energy i like to be around people um and yeah zoom doesn't do it for me so it's useful and you know i'll definitely be using it moving forward but i'm also definitely going to be checking out people's energy in person and linking up with people in person but you know for us yeah for example we've done i, I don't know how many hundreds of meetings over say, the last we've probably year. We've probably seen each other every day for the last exactly. year yeah but we but we haven't actually seen each other in real life in that exactly. so you know the fact that you're in liverpool and you're up north and i'm in london we've been able to do that that's brilliant but then you know, somebody that's half an hour down the road, I'd rather go and see them than go half an hour down the road, quite frankly. So I think it's going to be a mix, to be honest. Okay. Well, I, I'm hoping that it's a, it's a, it's a balance because I think there is something very human about actually interacting as opposed that's to just seeing, seeing someone flat on a, on a, on a screen. T, I'm going to come to you now. Um, Yo. Because obviously the live sector is taking a huge hit. Yes. And, and there's massive challenges and there's broad challenges, but I want to speak to you as, as like an artist and as a musician. Um, can you talk about how, how it's impacted you and, and kind of how you've got through a period? Because I know you've had some performances, but how you got through this period um, as, a, as a live artist? I think a lot of it uh, kind of came down to like adaptability. And you kind of realise with a few artists like that I'd seen kind of like peers, the people that had like, thrived through the pandemic and the people that hadn't thrived through the pandemic and I think it was like before this it was very easy to go like okay cool I'm putting out a song uh or I'm putting out an EP so I'm going to put that out and then I'm going to do some shows and then that's it and like it, it kind of like you didn't really have to be overly creative to be able to do it and I think when the pandemic happened it was like okay cool most of these kind of like easy resources have now been taken away so now I have to find and I know I have to try and find a fan base, but way more creative, way more creatively because everybody's trying to do the same thing. So it kind of it kind of left you in a space where it was like, I found that like it was the kind of the artists who were able to adapt and and kind of change what they were doing to be able to fit and either go and either just like add some more uh add some more tools to their backpack almost and kind of go, okay, cool. Like um like a couple of my couple of my friends did. A, like a gig in a box where they were like cool we're gonna make these boxes and like it's gonna be a live show in there it's gonna be a little kind of like it was like a crystal thing and some sort of like ritual thing and it's like a whole like you have an evening and you come and support us and like you pay this money and like you come to our gig except you do it from your front room and like it was those kind of things that I was like okay cool like this is the creative stuff that builds your fan base um that you can do through the pandemic and kind of made it yeah just kind of made some people a lot more accessible it was more about like oh cool come and see how I actually work because I'm stuck at home like everybody else and I think that was that was the main kind of thing it was the people that had the people that were able to adapt and to kind of go oh cool I'm going to be a little bit more creative like um like you, you were talking before and I was going to do like a uh, a live show uh exhibition thing and it was going to be in Liverpool and then like like it was the done thing to do because you know you put on like a live show for your EP that was going to come out but you know being able to move it online and to make it the thing where like oh cool I can send it to 
anybody I want to now and like the kind of industry heads that I probably wouldn't be able to get down I can easily send a link to and now it's a lot now like everything that I have is a lot more accessible and a lot more easy for people to see it's that it was like yeah it's that sort of thing of like the the pandemic I think it I think it helped a lot because it just made it brought back the creativity to artistry I find anyway um and I guess now moving forward it's about now being able to it was almost like a reawakening of we're creatives like that's what we do we find different ways to create we find interesting ways to 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 kind of show and tell our story through our music because it's not all about the music now so like it's it's finding different ways to go oh cool live shows are coming back but how can we still make it interesting how can we still be creative and be wild with it and really bring people into um our world um so i think it's been to be fair i think it's been a little bit of a blessing because it brought back the creativity nice perspective like very nice perspective what I, what i was i've got to say though is t talks about what he'd done as his backup to his he was already planning this really ambitious installation for his ep where each song would have a space and you kind of go into it and you're immersed and what he actually done where because the pandemic hit and he couldn't do that idea which i, I remember you bit you're quite far down the line if not like 70 percent of it done he took mm -hmm. it online and done an ar situation so you could actually go into different rooms where he was performing with his band and the scenery changed and all that. So he he puts it off like it was he, he just he just done an online <laughs> show, but it, it definitely was not an online show. It was it was something um really um ambitious. I know nobody particularly works in the live sector like like as a promoter here, but I was just wondering, and I'll throw this up at, at Ben actually, what do you think of the future of the live sector is gonna look like broadly? So we're talking, you know, T's talking. And Nikkei, you talked about the live streaming aspect and just, you know, being able to close the space between your fan base. But when we get back into it and the festivals start, you know, doing 300 festivals a summer and, you know, there's loads of shows and people can gig every night. People can sometimes, session musicians might do two or three a night. Do you, do you, do you think it's just going to go back to that standard way? Because now it's easy to say, I'm going to bring all these elements, but do you just see it just being a return back to normal after this? I, 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 I think they're going to go harder because they've had, you know, a year of no income. So the amount of jobs that have been lost in the live sector is is crazy. So I think they're going to go super hard to try and get revenues up. You're seeing it already. Like I know artists are being offered shows left, right, and center. Um, I know that that yeah, they're they're trying to play catch up as much as possible. And it's interesting because a lot of the live agents in order to keep going during the pandemic have become a uh, kind of brand, uh, like you can go, they'll, they'll facilitate brand partnerships for you now. So I think you're gonna see a lot more um, cross collaboration between artists, brands and live. I think that's gonna be something that, that starts to happen a lot, a lot more frequently, um, simply because, you know, in order to survive, they had to diversify. Mm. And, that that probably makes the most sense in my opinion for them to get even more money into a live performance is by bringing a brand brand on board tagging them into it so now you're you're generating more income that way so i think me personally i think it will it will probably head that way but i, I reckon you know Nikkei probably has has more of a handle on this as she's got active artists at the moment. That's not to say because obviously shaka, shaka shaka works he works that live circuit hard when he's when he when he's there, so yeah, what 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 what's what's his thought or what conversations are you having? If you can let us be privy to, to them. Yeah, to to be honest, it's like similar things to Ben, but like, so I'm I'm go to like MMF meetings, music managers forum meetings, and they're basically kind of just saying that, to be honest, like all the all the live shows that are going ahead is still up in the air whether like practically how it's going to run basically because the promoters don't have like uh, kind of solid insurance basically and the government's not trying to give them government backed insurance. So on that front, it's all looking a bit precarious still in terms of live. Um, but yeah, I echo Ben, I think people are missing it so much that there's a newfound appreciation of live. Um, I went to a show myself like last week uh, for that like, children as youth in Hackney Church and the vibe there, everyone was just so happy to be back, you know, like to, there's nothing that replaces being together with other people 
and looking to your left and right and oh you know the words oh this is your favorite song too kind of nothing replaces that do you know what I mean so I feel like definitely it's, it's going to be back stronger than ever and um, as Ben was saying I think well I know that definitely the latter half of this year's pack up with albums dropping um, and I know and loads of tours being announced whatever so definitely I think it's just gonna we're gonna be inundated it might the pendulum might swing the other way or get inundated and get maybe live show fatigue I don't know but um, everyone's desperate to get back and so yeah I think we're gonna be inundated in terms of um, Shaka with yeah we're talking about um, basically like socially distanced gigs you know um, but it's really difficult to make the maths work um, especially with someone like Shaka who's um, does he's not trying to do a DJ PA set up for a headline show do you know what I mean like he's wants to have a full band or at least a condensed band set up and so it's trying to make the numbers work with venues you know large enough large venues or large-ish venues but you'll only be able to sell half the tickets and then all that kind of and then the additional like um checks and stuff that you have to have for people you know so it's really difficult at the moment and um as uh, ben was talking about definitely there's a lot of conversation about brands being involved and partnering there's even a scheme i don't know if it's been it's kind of like i think it's not announced yet but with national the national lottery are trying to like help finance some stuff as well to make sure that gigs do go ahead because of this whole half capacity thing um i know also it's been like i've been speaking to um uh jls's management and they're trying to put together a tour as well and again that's all kind of like tricky you know i think everyone's just finding it tricky to make the numbers work basically but i do agree that people are going to find a way by hook or by crook because everyone wants live to come back <laughs> i'm telling you what nikkei's dropping some some bombs here mate some excuse <laughs> <laughs> just telling them all, all kinds of business man um Invest in the live space, that's all I'll say. If, if, if the National Lost are looking for some money, there's going to be a lot of money for them. Right? Um, yeah, I, I look at the live thing, I suppose, like you're saying in person, it's almost like it's almost like a good preacher, isn't it? A good preacher on li like doing a live stream online would be great. You'd go, oh my God, I still feel it. But if you're in a room with someone great speaking, it, it touches you differently. And I, I, I agree with you, Nika. I think people aren't going to trade that for a... For a um, a digital performance if they don't have to and i think that's going to be quite interesting there's a question which goes into the social distancing thing by emma friedman um, and she said as a full-time carer this COVID time has enabled me to access live performances and develop my performance skills at home with socially distancing distance gigs people have had somewhere to sit and table service do you think this style of event will continue that's quite interesting actually it's funny um when i was at the children of zeus gig i saw people sitting down more than ever like as, as the gig progressed like people started jumping up to the left but i thought to myself you didn't have seats before but everyone looked well comfortable <laughs> so I think, and also yeah it did hit me as well the fact that there was it was more um there's more accessible you know like because there's more space between the rows and all this kind of stuff so i yeah i think i think that profit will overrun everything. So uh, yeah, but I, I do think there will be some learnings from this, which is that people will have said, I really, you know, I really enjoyed the fact that I could sit down and there was more accessibility. So I think, I think we'll see incorporated, but I think ultimately profit is the, is the driving force, unfortunately. So I don't think it will, yeah, I don't think that will be a mainstay. As soon as they can pack everyone in a venue, they will. Yeah. yeah. As soon as getting the yeah. money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> so, and I think the other thing is we're going to have to relearn because we've unlearned everything that we knew before. Like, it was really funny. Yesterday, somebody asked me, um, oh, can you give me some, some networking events to attend? And I was like, I haven't been to a networking event in about 18 months, longer than that. I, I, I can't think of any. And I had to really rack my brain to think of what those were. And you know, 18 months ago, I would have gone this, 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 this. I just would have reeled them off second nature. So I think we're going to have to relearn kind of going out what it's like, the the defences that we put up, because, you know, it's like, oh, you're not wearing a mask or you're wearing a mask, you're not covering your nose. I'm not going near you and not standing too near people. And all. everything that we've kind of learned over the, net, the last year, we're going to have to unlearn. And, hey, even, and even, even the handshake, Ben? Even yeah. the handshake, people don't yeah. know what they're doing no more. They come <laughs> they don't know whether it's a handshake, an elbow, or just stand, stand away from someone. It's basic, basic stuff, isn't it? 
It's like we went in, in the studio the other day, so, you know, one of the writers gave me a hug and it was like, oh, we're not supposed to do that. <laughs> was, I was like, don't worry, I'm COVID free. He was like, yeah, I'm COVID free. And it was all good. But, you know, it, it's those types of things. Everyone's kind of second guessing themselves and they're going to have to unlearn a lot of things and relearn other things. And, yeah. Um, another question. We'll go to a question from um, the audience in a sec. But there's one question is, how do how will people get gigs? Do you think it will be the same? Because we talked about there's going to be a plethora of opportunity because there's going to be promoters and venues that are going to want to put up. Do you, do you think is it is it the same tactics or do you think there's more opportunity? Is like social media should 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 artists be doing something different on social media to cut through or is it the same is it the same situation as before? I just feel like what people will, I think that like what people will look at will be different. So in this, in this kind of pandemic time, there's a lot of people that have shone through on social media. So, and there's a lot of people that, um, like my friend plays for someone who's blown up over TikTok and now they've got festival slots because of TikTok. Do you know what I mean? And so I feel like there'll be a, I think most of it will be kind of the same, but I think a lot of it will be looking at social media and who can bring people in like, cool. There's a lot of TikTokers that have put out songs um, because there's money behind it now and so they'll probably get like your big like big ish festival slots so I, I think there is a kind of like a little bit of a shift in terms of like where people are looking for gigs I've always wondered if you book someone off TikTok or Vibe do you know if they've got full songs or is it like yeah. <laughs> I was about to say it's going to be interesting seeing what their live show looks like and yeah, it's more than one song. The real, yeah, like who's actually been putting in work and who's you know it's going to be interesting. You know, what's really, you know what's really interesting? Like I was with my niece and and I was playing some songs in the car, and she didn't have she didn't have a clue what they were, and then it got to the TikTok ten second bit. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I know this song. And then that 10 seconds passed, she's like, I don't, I don't know what's going on here. And it, it happened on about five, six, seven songs. So ben, I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna ask all previous questions. When are you, cause you are all involved obviously in different manners, making music and with music makers. When are you gonna start doing songs that are like 45 seconds long? <laughs> That's the day I get out of the game. <laughs> I, the algorithm, the algorithm unless, says unless it's, unless it's for an advert sync, then we're good. Mm. <laughs> um, I'll go back to the chat now. And again, all three of you might have views on this. It says, I'm new to audio visual production software, total amateur. What software would you recommend for a MacBook Pro and why? I think that, that's one for T, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, I, I mean, I guess it. Uh, I'd probably say like either Ableton or Logic Pro. Both of those seem to be almost like industry standard for um, making, yeah, making music in like a fun and creative way. No, sorry, this is the visual stuff. Oh, you you you've got some projection stuff, haven't you? Like Final Cut and stuff, right? Oh, like no Final Cut like and that. Lightroom. I I think I think Adobe is the thing. I think a lot of people kind of gravitate towards the Adobe suite. I think that's Premiere Pro. Which Come is the on, Nikkei, I know, I know Shaq has done some, some yeah. stuff. All I, what I gather from Shaq is that Adobe is like, if you're deep in the game and Final Cut is more entry level and user friendly, that's what I gather. There you go. <laughs> there you go. We're there, that we're co and no one's paid, no one's a sponsor. <laughs> um, you both manage, Ben and Nikkei, you both manage music curators who were super active and obviously T you're a music creator yourself. What impact has the pandemic had on music creation and, and production? Like the actual, I know Ben, you mentioned it before about doing sessions, but you, you know, have those sessions worked using the internet? Have they worked well? Did they work better in person? You know, has output changed or is it still the same process? You know, you know what was really interesting? Music. Like I've got an artist, a female artist, and before the pandemic, about six months before the pandemic, she went in a session and there's not many female producers. Um, and she went in a session with a, a, a writer called Gia Coco, who's from Holland. And it was longer than that, probably a year before the pandemic. She went in with Gia Coco and Gia is a beast with vocal production. Like she'll go in, she'll write the song and then she'll tell the producer to move out of the way while she, you know, comps the vocals, edits the vocals. She'll just go in on the vocal. And I remember Shan was like, oh man, I want to do that one day. And because of the
for my producers who'd usually kind of tidy up all her vocals to do it with her. So she'd have to send everything over and it just made the process really long and cumbersome. So what ends up happening was one evening they just gave her a tutorial on, on vocal production. And she got so into it, she just went on YouTube and just learned everything she could. And now, like, she, she's like, Gia, she'll go in the studio and she'll be like, let's get out of my way. And she'll comp her vocals and she'll, like, flawlessly to the point where she's, she's doing sessions with people in the States and they're, they're like, who, who comped the vocals? She's like, I did. They're like, oh, my God, this is, this is amazing. So, you know, she, I think it's been a real opportunity for those that, that want to add an extra string to their bow creatively to develop themselves, um, to develop skills, to, to try new things that they they might not have had the time to try because she wouldn't have had the time to, to sit down and spend that time learning how to how to mix her vocals, comp her vocals, edit her vocals, etc. She wouldn't have had that time. But because she was at home 24-7, it meant that she had that time. So I think that that was really useful. And I think, um, yeah, we got cuts from doing, doing Zoom sessions. So that was definitely productive <laughs> and it, you know it worked and and it and also in some instances it, it created relationships like you know the boys dot ink they went in sessions with people that they didn't necessarily know before um and they started to build a relationship with that person to to or people till now where they can just jump in the room with them and, and they can crack on and it you know i think I think the pandemic has been whatever you've wanted it to be. You know what I mean? Like there was a lot of people that were sunbathing and enjoying the sun last year and were like, hey, we got time off, we're chilling. And there are other people who are like, I'm gonna use this time really productively to grow, to strategize and to move forward. And I feel like for the talent that I look after, they, they really put the work in to grow, to develop. And they're coming out of the pandemic in a much stronger position and place than they were when they went in. And they, they've got a lot more respect from various players in the industry and, and other talent in the industry. And I think it's um, been a really productive time for them. And, you know, in some ways I'm thankful it's happened because it's allowed them to grow. And in other ways, I'm like, you know, in life ways, I'm like, but yeah, I think it's been really, really good if you've wanted to make something of it. Yeah, I totally agree. I think um, I think that it's been it's one. It's been a time to like learn, but number two, it's been a, like for me before the pandemic. If I was having a session with someone, it'd be like, oh, cool. I'm doing that person on Tuesday, that person on Thursday, whatever. But because of Zoom, you're not doing like a ten hour session, so you end up doing like, oh, cool. We'll do a four hour session. We'll do like four to eight or whatever. And then it means that like for me, I've become loads quicker because you just get stuff done. And I'm having like two or three sessions in a day. And like, it just means that now, like everything is a lot more quicker. So even if I am in like an in-person session, it doesn't take kind of a full day to finish a song. It may take half a day and we can go, oh, cool, let's stop it there and like chill and have the rest of the day. Or cool, we'll get in another session because you're just used to like working a lot quicker now because of the way that Zoom has been. Um, so yeah, I think it has been my productive. Yeah, I was just going to add that I think the first lockdown obviously like just rocked a lot of people like and um, <clears throat> like the on a creative front people felt torn and not in the right headspace to necessarily create because it was just like oh is this the apocalypse like is this, is this the end of the world yeah I mean we're seeing people you know dying every day and all this kind of stuff and so I feel it felt like I know for us anyway we, we were constantly having conversations about in terms of like promoting music, putting out music, whatever, like what's appropriate and kind of um, not being tone deaf, you know? Um, but I also think that kind of permeated into just uh, the creative energy of like Shaka definitely, but other artists as well. Um, but then as, as, as has been said, people then kind of turned the corner and realized, look, it's here to stay. We're gonna have several lockdowns, you know what I mean? And we have to kind of find a way to, to navigate it. And um, yeah, for Shaka, he hasn't really done as much of the virtual sessions. It's been a case of kind of people found ways to do in-person sessions. So like he did, he's part of a writing camp that was in um, the Angel Angelic Studios or whatever in Oxford or whatever. 
and basically everyone had to get their COVID test a few days beforehand. Do you know what I mean? When you rocked up, bring your evidence of your COVID test and checking temperatures, sanitizing, all that stuff. And they got, you know, busy for like a weekend and did a whole weekend of work. So I feel like, um, yeah, people have just, as um, has been said, like if you want to get work done, people have found a way. Um, and as we've also touched on, nothing beats being in person. Do you know what I mean? Especially for things like creating music and just creating connection, you know? So I feel like, um, yeah, I think people are going to continue to find a way to meet in person, even, you know, with all the challenges that that presents. Thank you very much. Um, another question to you, Nikkei. How has the pandemic altered the relationship between artist and consumer? We already, I suppose we already get into quite a direct one with socials and stuff, but do you, do you think this has changed that dynamic in any way? Um, a little bit, yeah. I think there's been a bit more of a focus, again, I think tied into the whole um, super focus on digital growth. I think there's been even more of a realisation of I really need to nurture and build my fan base and and also just with I think every, everything's everyone's been reevaluating everything basically and I feel like there's been more attention given to the whole director to consumer uh, model you know um more conversations about patreon and like um I, I saw in the news recently like but not in a good way but only fans I've seen that's popping off um, but all these platforms where people can kind of speak directly to their fans and I think there's been a real like well for us anyway there's been definitely a realization about um yes you've built up your fan base on these social media platforms but to a certain extent they hold you hostage like when you went when you go to promote something you have to spend stupid amounts of money to reach the thousands of people that you've gone to build up you know so that's why I think there's a growing and because that was the only medium by which we can communicate with consume with our fans it's now like wait a second like so I can't see them in live shows or whatever and this and that and that and I have to spend all this money just to try to get a message across to the people that I've spent years to culminate <laughs> so I think that's why people are kind of now looking like okay Patreon and similar similar platforms maybe that's the better model where you pay you know a commission um I think it's five percent to eight percent or whatever of whatever you you're charging your fans um, and you get to reach all of them. It's not a case of, you know, you you spend money and hope that all of them see whatever you've posted or whatever. So I think, um, I've forgotten what your question is now, but yeah, um, I hope that answers it. That's the direct the relationship between artists and, and, and consumer. consumer. Yeah, I think, I think yeah, I think people are just realizing that they need to take more ownership. Artists need to take more ownership of, of that relationship and yeah, and data's key and yeah, all that kind of stuff. Just, just piggybacking off of that, because you know, anybody that knows me knows that that I've always been an advocate for for um, rights ownership and, and doing the right deals. Like, there's nothing wrong with not only your rights, but it's about doing the right deal if you are going to do the right. And and for years, I've been talking about you know the true fan theory and making sure that you understand that it's a certain amount that you only require a certain amount of fans to be able to make a, a healthy living within the music industry. And this chase for you know, I need a hundred thousand. Instagram followers, I need a million, I need a million views on YouTube, doesn't actually need having a career that allows you to, to make a living. And the only way you do that is by building an actual community of fans that will invest in what it is you do. And if you can get, you know, a thousand fans that over the period of a year will spend 50 quid, you've made 50 grand, that's a healthy, healthy wage to live on. You know what I mean? So that that's at its most basic level, just breaking down the maths. And, and that's like eight quid a month. That's like a net worth of a Nando's a month. So if you can work out ways in which to engage your fans, get their data, communicate with them, you know, that's how you win. And what I've found is due to the pandemic, where I, I kind of found I was talking to a brick wall a lot of the time, I think people have been a lot more receptive to looking at alternative ways of, of engaging audiences, as, as Nikkei said, because, you know, now they're going, okay, I actually need to listen and look and work out how I can make a living, because it's great that I've got 150,000 followers on, on Instagram, but they ain't paying me no money. All they do is look at my picture and press a like button. Like, yeah. I need to know how many people are actually investing in what I do 
on a yearly basis. And, you know, you, there's so much that you can do. You can reward those people. You can go, you know, if you, if you set up right and get your data right and your data collection right, you can know who your most fanatical fan is and you can go, you know what, I'm going to call you up. I'm going to invite you out to dinner and da, 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 da. And that person will go from spending 50 pound a year to maybe 150 pound a year. You know what I mean? And, and so on and so forth. So, you know, with me being over at AIM, that's, that's, that's one of the things that I'm very much about helping people grow in their, grow their business and look at different methods of, of um, scaling what it is that they're doing from, you know, self-releasing artists to those that have a label with four, five, six, seven people in it, how you grow that and the different ways of engagement for, for revenue streams. Because, you know, I think people are more interested in that now than they ever have been. And I think as, as we see the independent sector taking more and more market share, it's evident that people are, are starting to really tap into that and take notice of that and do what they can to, to make the right choices and stay independent or do the right deal with a major so that their revenue stream makes sense. Wicked. Um, got one more question, We've got four minutes left. And this could go on for this could go on forever actually because I've got I've got well more questions but one more question from me, um, how can new artists and industry professionals protect themselves against the insecurities associated with a career in, in the music? Because right now, everything you must be hearing if you're getting into this game is how insecure, how fragile it is. It's not funded. You know, forty percent of people are leaving the industry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what can new artists and you know, building in industry professionals do to kind of manage those insecurities as they make that leap in? I think Ben's touched on it, you know, it's like about from the very outset, like ownership and like building organic, authentic relationship with your, your fan base, you know, like um, when you do that, you are in the driving seat, you know, like it's not a case of you're riding, you put out one track, it's a hit, um, and then, but no one's connected the hit to you personally as an artist. And so you're just kind of out there hoping for another hit. If you kind of develop a relationship, like obviously historic, like pre-pandemic, that development of a relationship often happened live in person, you know, but it's about thinking, as we said on this call, outside of the box, really creatively about, okay, how do I personalize and how do I make, how do I draw my fans in and bring them into my world in the most impactful way where they feel that they're getting to know me um, and they're invested in my journey and they want me to win? And then how do I just nurture that fan base as much as possible and retain as much ownership and, you know, um, over that so that, yeah, whatever you want, you know, when things hopefully do return back to some sort of normality that you're able to say, I'm going to do a live show and you're confident about the numbers of the people that are going to turn up. Do you know what I mean? So I think it's about, yeah, kind of focus it, not kind of, um, not wanting a quick overnight, you know, success throwing money at stuff to try and get, as was said, you know, 100,000, a million views or whatever. It's more about, yeah, trying to build an authentic, uh, genuine relationship with your friends so that you have confidence that, yeah, of where you are in, in your career journey, if that makes sense. Also to like piggyback on that, it's also about like, um, doing that with kind of collaborators as well it's like I've I've like me personally as an artist I've had like uh, people come to me from like theater things and things like that because of the stuff that I've done which kind of keep money flowing and keep things in so also having the fans but also having people around you that can go like oh cool like we have a sick relationship and we can work together and I'll bring you in when I do this and you'll bring me in when you do this and, and that sort of thing and just yeah and, and just, just to add to that I think from a executive point of view if you're coming in and you know I think don't be afraid to ask for help no matter what level you're at um something I had a problem with early in my career like the, the, the people going to look at me like I don't know what I'm doing if I'm asking for help and you know I ask for help now more than ever <laughs> ever before <laughs> you know and and I've realized that it's actually the key that that really mm. is the key like know what you don't know and ask for help wonderful advice thank you very much everyone um for tuning in and thank you very much to this esteemed panel who um i think have shown that you can come through the pandemic bigger better stronger than ever and uh, 
and, and, and the, I'd make a moves every single day. So we want to say thanks to the two funky arts funders, Arts Council and Why Heritage Fund. There's loads of stuff going on over this weekend, so make sure you stay tuned in. Um, socials, Two Funky Empire, and hopefully everyone has a good Two Funky Festival over the next couple of days. See you later. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye. See you later.